Well, listen, I am delighted to be here tonight, and I'm happy to see all of you here. And I know some of you librarians have been here since 8.30 this morning, and I'll try to make this lively for you. Just as a show of hands, how many folks here maybe are on the uh, past their 50th birthday? But those that raised your hands for advertisers, you're basically now dead. Essentially, we, wanted, we ignored anybody who won 18 to 49. If you were 50 and older, we wanted to sell you, I don't know, Depend or Geritol. <laughs> so we needed to figure out what's going on with this generation. So I actually partnered up with a marketing research firm, and we went out and did research. I realized something. As I get older and older, I realize something, that with age comes wisdom. I'm getting smarter. My kids don't think so, but I think so. What if... What if I told you, now let's look forward 20 years, let's think about is there something now that's going to happen, that's happening already, that's going to be equally as profound, transformative, industry changing, revolutionary, global, permanent? Water cars. But if, the, if there, yeah, flying cars, we're hoping for that. But my question is, if I told you what it is, would you act differently today, tomorrow, 2015? 26. Of course you would. But there is something. There is something. And it's 100% guaranteed to happen. What is it? Well, the age shift. The U.S. population, according to the Census Bureau, the over age 65 is going to basically double between now and 2030. But here's one of the things that's going to change. Being old, not going to be such a, a bad thing anymore. But the thing that's really going to drive a lot of the change for us in the near term is the change agent. And the change agent for a lot of this is going to be us boomers who are at this stage of life where I believe Madeline used the term discretionary time. We're going to be the ones that change a lot of stuff. Now, the shift in priorities really does happen around age 50 where you stop trying to focus so much on becoming someone and focus more on being someone. You stop going after success and you start thinking about, what's my significance? In 1970, in fact, according to the Census Bureau, the percentage of 60-year-olds who still had any parent alive was 13%. Today, 50%. Boomers, standing here at 65 looking ahead going, why am I going to quit? I've got 20 or 30 more years. My bonus is now. That's pretty cool. Us boomers came of age at a different time. We came of age with things like the uh, birth of, of TV, the Vietnam War, Kennedy's Camelot, you know, the birth of rock and roll, the civil rights movement, the women's live movement. We had Nixon and Watergate and all sorts of different things imprinted us. The drug culture, going to the moon. So all of those things lead to a different set of generational values. Yes, we are very much a generation built on personal gratification. You know where we got that from? Our parents. We knew about the boom almost immediately. Newsweek magazine, 1948. Boom in babies, what it means to America. How did they know? Social Security registrations went through the roof in 1946, 1947, and 1948. And somebody noticed. Holy cow, we're having so many more babies. What's going to happen? But our mantra is going to be the, the other side of that coin. We say it's, we're going after the fountain of vitality. We're going to stay vital until we take our last breath. And hopefully we die downhill skiing at 85. We're the generation that, that did aerobics. Now we're going to do mental aerobics as we go forward. Social vitality. We're not uprooting ourselves, moving to Florida and, and you know, buying some condo somewhere, moving to Sun City, Arizona. We're staying in our communities. Look at all of you in your communities, engaged. The question is, what are we going to do next? Because now we've got time and experience and wisdom and opportunity. How do you make your organization more relevant to your community? We've got a generation now already that are kind of isolated in their homes as they get older. Every survey done by AARP and others about boomers and growing older, they say, yeah, I want to stay in my home. I'm never moving to assisted living. I'm never going to live in a nursing home. Forget that. You take me out in a pine box before I'll do that. 
Ministry. So what you can do in your community to connect with your community and connect with boomers in a way that makes you relevant is, you know, don't be segregating them. Don't have programs for old and programs for young. Have programs for both. The interesting thing is research shows that the older you get, the more you rely on your gut to make decisions, how you feel about something. And you think about it, it's like, okay, you're a, a young person, you're going to go out and buy a, a refrigerator, and you're going to study it, because it's a big expense for you, and you're going to make sure that you make the right decision for you, so it's very rational. You're 55 years old, your refrigerator breaks, and you need a new refrigerator, you're going to go to Lowe's or Home Depot and you find one and go like, yeah, I want that one. You don't process do not, you process do. It's like, this is basic communication stuff. So we really mess up, especially when we get to older people, because we do stuff like this. This is not your average active adult community. And guess what I read it as? It's your average active adult community. Thanks for telling me that. So, you know, don't miss what's happening at the museum today. Guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to miss it. So, like, come find out what's happening at the museum today. Entice me. Be positive. In Arizona, they put together a whole Boomer initiative. They went out and got funding. They got a grant, and they did this whole Boomer program. And they had all sorts of stuff under here, and nobody came. Why? Because nobody thought, thinks of themselves as a Boomer. And the thinking is, you really have to kind of flip it around. You've got to take your programs and kind of put them up top, and maybe have a theme above it that you can tie the, the programs together, so one of the other strategies we suggest is, you don't have to invent the, the wheel. Go find what somebody else has done and see if, find out if it's working and see how you can make it work. But they don't care how old you are when you show up. It's not about age. And the term that we think maybe can work is kind of what Denver did, fresh city life. It's about life and it's about all aspects of your life. And you know, the library can actually be a resource for your whole life. We have boomers that come to our libraries that want to volunteer because they want that experience of sharing what they've learned through travel, what they, maybe they <coughs> used to be a school teacher and they want to help either in the Friends bookstore or they want to read aloud to children or whatever. So we do have a lot of volunteers coming out of the boomers. You mentioned that uh, one of the things we needed to do is stay mentally active, lose it, mm -hmm. use it or lose it. And I've also read that um, becoming our, connecting with our creativity at this age is one way to stay mentally active. So museums, well, libraries too, but I happen to be on the art side of things, um, can have more uh, different kinds of classes where people can develop their creativity. Remember that book, he, uh, you know, A Thousand Places to See Before You Die? Huge bestseller. Why? Because it's experiences. I can go collect experiences. That bumper sticker from, from the 80s, he who, he who has the most stuff when he dies wins. It's now he who has the most experiences before he dies wins. So deliver experiences. I want to share the story with you of the Royal Calcutta Golf Club. They opened it with great fanfare in 1835. They brought everybody out. They discovered that they had a problem with the locals. The local monkeys found that those little white golf balls rolling across the green was pretty interesting. So they'd run out and they'd pick them off. And the British are like, well, this isn't going to work. So they gathered up all the monkeys and they shipped them 20 miles away. Three days later, all the monkeys were back, scurrying around all over the golf course. So they built a 30-foot tall fence around the entire outside of the golf course. And what did the monkeys do? They were over the fence, climbing around, chasing after the golf balls. So finally, the British said, you know what? We're going to have to put in a local rule. Now, there have never really been local rules in golf. Golf had only been in the British Isles. So they said, we need a local rule. So they put a sign up on the first tee, and that sign is still there today. And it says, play the ball where the monkey drops it. <laughs> and that, my friends, is a perfect metaphor for the opportunity in front of you. It may not be where you thought it was. The monkey may have picked it up and moved it, but you got to go find it and you got to play it straight and true right down the middle once you find it. Thank you very much for your time tonight.